Uh, I was informed in the course of my official duties of a multi-decade uh, UAP crash retrieval and reverse engineering program. Uh, to which I was denied access to those additional read-ons when I uh, requested it. I made the decision, based on the data I collected, to report this information to my superior, superiors and multiple inspectors general, and in effect becoming a whistleblower. That statement and the testimony of David Grush in 2023 caused quite a stir in the government and the UFO community. But of course the government has to try to ruin all the fun. In March 2024, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, part of the Department of Defense, released a report saying that they talked to all the agencies and they didn't find any evidence that would support what Grush said. But in that same report, they disclosed a proposed program that sounds almost exactly like what Grush described, a proposed UAP recovery and reverse engineering program called Kona Blue. A month later, in April 2024, they released records relating to Kona Blue. The proposed program included reverse engineering UAPs and other, let's call it, non-traditional science. Spoiler, I'm talking about remote viewing and teleporting. But some say that Kona Blue was really a white hat group trying to uncover the clandestine activities of deep state actors that have been hiding otherworldly advanced technology for decades. Is there any truth to that? Let's see what the evidence says. On this project, we'll look at the history of Kona Blue, what it aimed to do, why the program didn't move forward, and whether the government is still hiding something. My name is Face, and welcome to Project Conspiracy. The All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or ARO, was founded in 2022 and is part of the Department of Defense. It investigates UFOs, USOs, and that sort of thing. Today, we're going to be looking at two sets of documents released by ARO in 2024. The first document set is a report released on March 8, 2024, entitled Report on the Historical Record of U.S. Government Involvement with Unidentified Anomalous Phenomenon, UAP, Volume 1. I'll call this the Aero Report, so I never have to say that group of words ever again. The Aero Report arose from Aero's obligation to prepare a written report detailing the historical record of the United States government relating to unidentified anomalous phenomenon. And this 63-page Aero report went through about 80 years of government programs that have investigated UAPs, all the way back to 1945, and made some conclusions based on its investigation. Aero said that it found no evidence that any sighting of a UAP represented extraterrestrial technology or to support claims that the U.S. government and private companies have been reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology. But the Aero report did disclose a very interesting proposed classified program. One name program was a UAP-related Prospective Special Access Program, PSAP, called Kona Blue, that was proposed to the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, and supported by individuals who believed the U.S. government was hiding off-world technology. The program was never approved by DHS, and its supporters never provided empirical evidence to support their claims. That's a pretty loaded statement, and we're going to do our best to get to the bottom of it. But in a weird and uncharacteristic move, the government decided to be extra transparent, and in April 2024, Arrow released 56 pages of documents directly related to the proposed Kona Blue program. There's a lot going on in these documents, and also a lot missing from them. So we'll focus on the relevant portions of the documents and fill in the gaps in the story where necessary. Kona Blue goes something like this. On June 24, 2009, Senator Harry Reid wrote a letter to Deputy Secretary of Defense William Lynn. Since the Advanced Aerospace Threat and Identification Program, ATIP, and study were first commissioned, much progress has been made with the identification of several highly sensitive, unconventional aerospace-related findings. Given the current rate of success, the continued study of these subjects will likely lead to technology advancements that in the immediate near term will require extraordinary protection. Due to the sensitivities of the information surrounding aspects of this program, I require your assistance in establishing a restricted special access program with a bigoted access list for specific portions of the ATIP. So a special access program, or SAP, is a security protocol that provides highly classified information with special safeguards and access restrictions. Think Black Project level security. And we also saw Reed discuss the ATIP program in the letter. The book Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, written by James Lukatsky, Colm Keller, and George Knapp, says that Reed was actually talking about a program called ALSAP, 
which stands for Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Application Program. If you haven't heard of this book before and think the name is, well, weird, it'll all make sense in a few minutes. People use ALSAP and ATIP interchangeably, and the acronym BOMIC gets confusing. But ALSAP and ATIP weren't the same thing. The Aero report said, unlike ALSAP, ATIP was never an official DOD program. However, after ALSAP was canceled, the ATIP moniker was used by some individuals associated with an informal, unofficial UAP community of interest within DOD that researched UAP sightings from military observers as part of their ancillary job duties. Both Lou Elizondo and Skinwalkers at the Pentagon said pretty much the same thing. So ATIP wasn't an official program, but ALSAP was, and the story of Kona Blue begins with ALSAP. ALSAP was located within the Defense Intelligence Agency, or DIA, which is part of the Department of Defense. The Aero Report says the primary purpose of ALSAP was to investigate potential next-generation aerospace technologies, but ALSAP also did UAP research by looking at cases, and they set up laboratories to examine any recovered UFO materials. Let that one sink in a second. From the reading I've done, it sounds to me like ALSAT was much more focused on UAPs than the Aero Report wants to admit. But the Aero Report did acknowledge that ALSAP investigated UAP and paranormal activity at a property in Utah. That property was the infamous Skinwalker Ranch. And this is where it gets interesting. Before Reed's 2009 letter, in May of 2008, Senators Reed, NOA, and Stevens met with DIA officials to express their interest to establish a research program involving exotic sciences. The senators got the money for it, and the ALSAP program started, and they contracted with a private corporation to do the work. The contract was awarded to Bigelow Aerospace, a company based in Nevada and headed by wealthy businessman Robert Bigelow. Harry Reid, by the way, was a senator for Nevada. Reid and Bigelow met in the 1990s and were both open-minded to looking into UFOs and non-traditional sciences. They say the two questions that Bigelow constantly pursued were one, is there other life in the universe? And two, what happens after we die? Both very good questions. Honestly, I'm not against using some of our government taxpayer money studying these things, especially since taxpayer dollars just grow on trees, right? But Bigelow was also the owner of Skinwalker Ranch. If you're not familiar, that's a 500 acre cattle ranch located in Utah that has a history of reported paranormal phenomena like aliens, interdimensional shapeshifters, and lots of other terrifying things. Some people suspect there's an interdimensional portal in the area. And ALSAP spent quite a bit of time studying Skinwalker Ranch. Getting back to the letter, why did Senator Reed use the wrong program name? Well, Senator Reed knew that this 2009 letter was unclassified, so he used ATIP as a nickname for ALSAP in the letter. That way, he didn't have to refer to ALSAP by name in case the letter ever got out, which, of course, it did. In December 2017, the famous New York Times article, Glowing Ours and Black Money, the Pentagon's mysterious UFO program reported on ATIP and even interviewed Harry Reid. But this article was actually talking about ALSAP and mistakenly referred to it as ATIP, quite possibly because of this 2009 letter from Senator Reid. Anyways, after ALSAP got started, some of the people involved in ALSAP had been trying to collaborate with other parts of the government, like the Air Force. But these agencies wouldn't participate since ALSAP didn't have SAP status. And despite Senator Reid's request, ALSAP wasn't given SAP status. By December 1st, 2010, Ronald Burgess, director of the DIA, prepared a memorandum acknowledging Senator Reid's 2009 letter and discussing what happened with ALSAP. In November 2009, Deputy Secretary of Defense Lynn and I met with Senator Reid to discuss this program. At that time, we determined the reports were of limited value to DIA. However, I did suggest they could be of merit to other organizations and that upon the completion of the DIA contract, the project could be transitioned to another agency or component better suited to oversee the project. The old, it's not you, it's me routine. You're giving me the it's not you, it's me routine? <laughs> I invented it's not you, it's me. Nobody tells me it's them, not me. If it's anybody, it's me. All right. George, it's you. You're damn right it's me. But Reed wasn't deterred, and the ALSAP group got to work on finding a new department since the DOD didn't want them anymore. There's plenty of fish in the endless sea of government agencies. On February 7, 2011, James Lukatsky, who is one of the main characters of the ALSAP and Kona Blue story, 
gave a detailed briefing to the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate about the program. The Undersecretary for DHS Science and Technology was Dr. Tara O'Toole, and she's repeatedly mentioned in the Kona Blue documents, including a July 11, 2011 letter that she signed approving the creation of Kona Blue as a DHS Prospective Special Access Program, or PSAP. If you're getting tired of the acronyms, blame the government. I take no responsibility. But the perspective is important because the project still has to be approved by the DHS and the Special Access Program Oversight Committee, or SAPOC. In other words, at this point, they're working to establish Kona Blue as a SAP, but the program is not up and running yet. And this is the fun part. At some point, the DHS prepared what looks like a PowerPoint and a pretty detailed outline explaining the program. The purpose of these documents wasn't provided, but I assume this was part of the SAP package to present for the program's formal approval. We'll start by looking at the PowerPoint. Here it says this is an unacknowledged, waived PSAP. What does that mean? An unacknowledged SAP is made known only to authorized persons, including members of the appropriate committees of the United States Congress. And waived SAPs are unacknowledged SAPs that are exempt from most reporting requirements. In other words, if you even find out that these programs exist, something went wrong. Another interesting development, these documents weren't scheduled to be declassified until April 25th, 2036, but they released them in April 2024, which makes you wonder why they'd released them 12 years early. Next, the government gave a general description of the program and outlined how much money they were looking for. For the fiscal year of 2012, 12 million, 2013, 25 million, and 2014, 35 to 50 million. That's almost as much as NASA spends a day. I only wish I was joking. But what were they actually looking to do with that money? Well, they touch on it in the PowerPoint, but another released document gives a lot of information about the Kona Blue program and objectives. It starts by saying the program will consist of seven operational centers. We'll talk more about those centers in just a minute. But the next question they address is justification for need. And the document speaks for itself here. Remote vision, remote communication, and de rematerialization techniques to observe, communicate, retrieve data, and transfer matter across dimensional and spacetime barriers will undoubtedly be of an utmost interest, if not a top collection priority, for adversarial intelligence slash security services. Countermeasures against such techniques would also be a collection priority. I'd say Project Stargate is back, but did it ever really leave? Recovered AAV technology exists in and is accessible only within a SAP construct. AAV means Advanced Aerospace Vehicle. Remember, these documents were written in 2011, and the term UAP didn't start getting used until about 2021. What I'm trying to say is, when they say AAV, they're talking about exactly what you think they're talking about. Retrieval and integration of historical data from high-value personnel with knowledge of recovered AAV technology and present location of recovered material is accessible only within a SAP construct. Wait, recovered AAV technology? We have that? But they get more specific about what Kona Blue would be doing in response to question five. The structure of Kona Blue consisted of two primary components or centers, the Advanced Technology Center and Experimental Centers. These would be supported by five additional centers. Let's take a look at these centers. The first two are the Data Collection Center and Data Analysis Center. These basically wanted to investigate, organize, and manage AAV reports. The deliverables would include an internet site, master data warehouse, monthly case reports and analyses, and special reports on historical data analysis. But they take it up a few notches with the Advanced Technology Center. The mission of the Advanced Technology Center is to establish a comprehensive program First, to gain access to and inventory all existing caches of ADAV materials and documentation within CONUS, whether residing in archive storage or under active program investigation in national laboratories, government organizations, and or contractors. AKA, they're going to round up all the UAPs that have been recovered, because we apparently have those. The deliverables of the Advanced Technology Center would include an inventory of AAV hardware, materials and documentation in a database format, and also based on the identification of and negotiation with present holders, stewards of AAV hardware, materials and documentation, governmental or privatized, protocols for information sharing and access will be developed. So they envisioned having to negotiate with the people holding the UAP technology. 
They also say that when appropriate, in-house or outsourced laboratory experimentation will be initiated to explore as yet unidentified characteristics and functions of AAV materials and devices in the inventory and results reported. That's a fancy, extremely convoluted way of saying reverse engineering UAPs. This center would also do some poking around in the form of an oral history initiative, which included gathering all information pertaining to the location of advanced aerospace technology and biological samples. I'm sure the powers that be were excited about that. Next, the experimental centers dealt with a lot of miscellaneous technology studies like infrared, biosensors, etc. But the deliverables would include detailed logs, oral histories transcribed from notes or interviews of human observers engaging with the AAV phenomenon in any modality will be collected and entered into the database. Then there's the Consciousness Center. This is basically a sleep study program to improve CPAP machines. I'm kidding, the truth is way cooler. The Consciousness Center would aim to extend remote communication programs to communicate and retrieve data across dimensional space-time barriers. Develop remote viewing and remote communication countermeasures, study consciousness interactions with and control of technology, and conduct experiments to determine baseline parameters for physical transport across dimensional space-time barrier, as opposed to communication and data transfer only. That's right, they wanted to teleport. Or maybe use wormholes. Tough to say. Sounds crazy, right? Here's what I'll say. I've been looking into quantum physics stuff recently, I don't think we should be so quick to label these kind of ideas as crazy, but that's a different project for a different day. The medical center would examine and catalog the physiological and medical effects of AAVs. Notice how pretty much every center has some AAV related objective. And the education center would use volunteers to provide initial data collection capability within their state or immediately adjacent states. It sounds like this one may have been intended to collaborate with MUFON or a similar organization. And DHS gave other details about the program. They had a site picked out for it at a new five-building complex located in Las Vegas, Nevada, conveniently located right where Bigelow Aerospace operates. And the DHS also had its eye on a 480-acre research property in Utah with a 15-year history of intensive anomalous activity. They blacked out the name of the owner of the property, so I guess we'll never know what property they were talking about, right? But if you think this all sounds ridiculous and that's why the program didn't move forward, based on the evidence, it looks like this Kona Blue proposal was just a continuation of the work they were already doing at ALSAP, aka ATIP. Remember that Reed wanted to continue it at the DOD as a SAP, and when they canceled it, he just brought it to the DHS. The Aero report said that the proposed Kona Blue lines of effort closely mirrored those conducted by the private sector organization for ALSAP ATIP. And the authors of the Kona Blue documents apparently felt this way too. When describing the history of the project, the Kona Blue documents say that ATIP, aka ALSAP, was first sponsored in the fiscal year 2008 Defense Supplemental Act by Senators Reed and Inouye with a $10 million ad. In other words, it looks like ALSAP had already been doing a lot of what Kona Blue set out to do. To get the program going, there were several meetings about Kona Blue throughout 2011 which culminated in a November 21, 2011 meeting with Dr. Tara O'Toole and the Special Access Program Oversight Committee, SAPOC. The meeting was chaired by Jane Lute, who was the Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security and second in command at the DHS at the time. And the DHS was kind enough to release the minutes of this meeting. Here's what happened. They started by noting that the meeting was put together with a sense of urgency, which was the impending transfer of funds to DHS from Senators Reed and Lieberman to conduct the Kona Blue program. Dr. O'Toole then discussed the history of the program while it was at DIA. Then, someone asked why they thought it should be a special access program. The general counsel answered this one, and looks like it was redacted due to privilege. This redaction proves to be important later. But then they asked why DHS was selected for the program. Dr. O'Toole explained that the senators felt that the technologies involved affected the security of the United States and was more than worthy of further investigation. Dr. O'Toole explained that there is very serious science involved with this program and that she felt the U.S. government had the responsibility to continue its investigation. Then they had some red tape discussions about the Office of Science and Technology's authority to collect anything and about the legalities of information collection. They closed the meeting as follows. Finally, the S2 tasked Dr. O'Toole and Mr. Cover 
with preparing a 5 to 10 page paper that fully documents how we got to where we are now with the Kona Blue program, its provenance, history, while at DIA, and exactly what science would be researched that had applicability to the DHS mission. S2 is still not certain of what the it is in the program, or otherwise what exactly we are researching. She also stated that some kind of formal request to DHS to accept this program and the associated funding would be very helpful. Two days later, on November 23, 2011, a draft of the requested paper was made, and it looks like Dr. O'Toole turned that into a formal memorandum to Deputy Secretary Lute on November 28, 2011. The next month, in December, a memo was prepared documenting the outcome of the proposed Kona Blue program. On December 8, 2011, a progress review of the PSAP was conducted with Deputy Secretary Lute and several others present. Under Secretary O'Toole was invited but was unable to attend. Seems like it would be pretty important for Dr. O'Toole to be at this meeting. So where was she? According to the Senate Daily Digest, O'Toole was giving testimony at a hearing about passenger screening technology at U.S. airports. A little strange to schedule the meeting when you knew she wouldn't be able to attend, but maybe I'm being paranoid. At the meeting, Deputy Secretary Lute then had questions about the justification of the program having SAP status and whether the budget and personnel requirements were sufficient. Per the memo, at the conclusion of the discussion, Deputy Secretary Lute directed that the PSAP be terminated immediately. Just one question, why? This memo didn't tell us anything. But a year and a half later, on June 5, 2013, a memorandum for the record was prepared by Stephen Cover. The Deputy Secretary made the determination that DHS was not going to execute activities proposed for the DHS S&T PSAP Kona Blue. In conjunction with the General Counsel, it was decided that the program as proposed did not require extraordinary security measures and terminated all activities within the department and further directed the SAPCO to initiate appropriate program close-down procedures. So according to this, they shut Kona Blue down because it didn't require extraordinary security measures which is convenient because that's the only part of the November meeting minutes that was redacted relating to why it needed SAP status. We don't know what the General Counsel said about its PSAP status, so we still don't know what the rejection of the program was based on. Another question I had was if Kona Blue didn't need SAP status, why didn't they just move forward without it as a regular program? The memo actually purports to answer that question and says no documentation exists to downgrade, reclassify, or determine other disposition. Okay. Doesn't that just mean no one filled out the paperwork to do that? Why not? I feel like there's a piece of this story missing. Let's think about it. Senator Reid gets funding for all SAP at the DIA, then tries to convert it to a SAP. The DIA responds by canceling the program. So Reid and the gang reboot for the DHS. DHS denies it because it doesn't need SAP status, and the program just dies. And also remember that the DHS rejecting the program was basically saying no to Senators Reed and Lieberman, who were powerful senators who were pushing to get the program funded. It feels like a part of this story is missing, and some suspect that there's more going on here that meets the eye. So what did the March 2024 Arrow Report say about Kona Blue? The Arrow report said that it was rejected by DHS leadership for lacking merit. Weird, because I just read a memo from the files you released saying it was rejected because it didn't need SAP status. At the very least, I'd call this statement in the Arrow report misleading, and it seems like the Arrow report is trying to spin Kona Blue to sound like it's nonsense. I don't think it's nonsense. Dr. O'Toole didn't think it was nonsense, and even called it very serious science. I bet a lot of other reasonable people don't think it's nonsense either. But from what I've read of the Arrow report, it seems like a big old pile of hot garbage. Yes, they asked all the different agencies for information, but it sounds like they basically blindly accepted everything that they were told at face value and didn't do much digging. This actually sounds familiar. If the United States Air Force did recover alien bodies, they didn't tell me about it either. And I want to know. But the Arrow report appears to just be a compilation of the information these agencies were willing to tell them. You can probably find something similar on Reddit, only better written and with less spin. And Arrow continued this angle when discussing the proponents of Kona Blue. Here's what it said. 
Arrow assesses that the inaccurate claim that the U.S. government is reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology and is hiding it from Congress is, in large part, the result of circular reporting from a group of individuals who believe this to be the case, despite the lack of any evidence. Many of these individuals were involved in or supportive of a canceled DIA program and the subsequent but failed attempt to reestablish this program under DHS, called Kona Blue. Kona Blue's advocates were convinced that the U.S. government was hiding UAP technologies. They believed that creating this program under DHS would allow all of the technology and knowledge of these alleged programs to be moved under the Kona Blue program. The program would provide a security and governing structure where it could be monitored properly by congressional oversight committees. The Arrow report also made sure to note in bold italics that no extraterrestrial craft or bodies were ever collected. This material was only assumed to exist by Kona Blue advocates and its anticipated contract performers. But let's think about the individuals behind OSAP and Kona Blue, who the Arrow report says were convinced that the U.S. government was hiding UAP technologies. The people behind the project were folks like Senators Reed, Lieberman, Inouye, and Stevens, businessman Robert Bigelow, James Lekatsky, Dr. Tara O'Toole, and many others. These are intelligent, well-respected, powerful people who probably have more information on this issue than most. If these are the people that Arrow is trying to paint as crazies, this just makes me think there might be something else going on here. And there are plenty of theories about what really happened to Kona Blue. One of these theories is that the program actually continued as a black program or a SAP, perhaps by another name, and that this information was communicated to people like David Grush. Obviously, the government wouldn't admit this. And if the SAP program is functioning correctly, we'd never find out about it. So this one's basically impossible to prove for us normies. Others say that Kona Blue was canceled due to DHS being a young department still trying to establish itself, and it didn't want to get caught up in anything that might bring negative attention. To be fair, in 2011, UFOs were much more firmly entrenched in the woo-woo category than they are today, so this seems logical enough. But DHS never gave this reason in the documents they gave us. DHS said they didn't think that the program needed SAP status, so if you take the government at its word, which is often difficult to do, then this one doesn't hold much weight either. One thought I had was what if the project was redundant, aka there was already a SAP doing this exact work somewhere deep in the bowels of the federal government. Again, we'd have no way to know this unless someone told us. You know, someone in the government who would be in a position to have knowledge of that type of program. Uh, I was informed in the course of my official duties of a multi-decade uh, UAP crash retrieval and reverse engineering program. Oh, and Ross Coulter at News Nation, the journalist who had one of the first interviews with David Grush in 2023, also think there's more going on behind the scenes here. And it's very interesting because I'm told there is a split between the intelligence community and the Defence Department. The Pentagon's decided to bluff it out and go it alone. There are people who are passionately of the view that there is authentic, recovered, non-human technology in the possession of the United States. And they are determined to get access to it so that its utility can be exploited, weapons can be developed, technologies can be advanced to the benefit of the American people. The problem is there's a group inside the Pentagon, they believe, who are blocking access to this technology. And that's what the decision to not make Kona Blue a special access program was all about. This was an attempt by a group of committed people people inside the Pentagon who, who do believe this technology exists to try and make sure that they did everything properly by the book, right. by the law. And uh, unfortunately, we have a situation now where the government is actively being, I believe, misled by people in the Pentagon who have determined to try and cover up and deceive the American public. Obviously, these types of claims are difficult to prove due to the secrecy around the programs. But Coulter claims to have sources. But I do right. think there's a preponderance of evidence that suggests there really is something to this. And I've spoken directly to a, a former U.S. Navy director of science technology development, Nat Kobitz, who, before he died, went on the record with me, admitting that he had been, quote, read in to a UFO crash retrieval and reverse engineering program. And in May 2024, Carl Nell, Army colonel turned CEO who has been involved with the UAP task force 
echoed what Brush and Coulter said about what's going on. And, and so, Carl, here's, here's the million dollar question. Do you believe that a higher form of non-human intelligence has visited this planet? Right. So non-human intelligence exists. Non-human intelligence has been interacting with humanity. This interaction is not new and it's been ongoing. And there are unelected people in the government that are aware of that. And, and so, Carl, that is quite a bold statement. I'm wondering and I'm curious, how confident are you that that is true? There's zero doubt. So do these individuals have information that we don't? Almost certainly. And if we look at the situation around the Kona Blue documents, it looks like at least part of the government is not actually interested in disclosure right now. Let's think about it. In 2023, we had the congressional hearing in which David Grush spilled the beans and is now known as a whistleblower. But Edward Snowden is a whistleblower and he's been on the run for over a decade. Why isn't Grush in jail? Well, Grush went through the appropriate processes in order to say what he said. But we can't turn a blind eye to the possibility that either Grush may be wrong, which is why they let him talk, or it's part of some sophisticated, very public disinformation campaign. Who knows what's real anymore? That said, it's interesting that the government immediately started trying to change the narrative after that 2023 hearing with Grush. Which leads us back to the 2024 Arrow report. It says that Kona Blue was brought to Arrow's attention by interviewees who claimed that it was a sensitive DHS compartment to cover up the retrieval and exploitation of non-human biologics. It sounds like Kona Blue documents weren't originally given to Arrow, which is part of the DOD. And this is because they weren't. DHS sent the Kona Blue documents to the DOD on February 5th, 2024. Then, in March 2024, they released the Arrow report saying Kona Blue lacked merit. By the way, this is called softening the blow. Because in April 2024, after the Arrow report was released, the DOD finally released the Kona Blue documents. By then, Kona Blue is out of the news cycle. The point here is that it looks like the government is still playing games and very much trying to control the UAP narrative. But why? Who cares anymore? It's 2024, just tell us. Well, let's look at the bigger picture and use our imaginations. Imagine that the government started investigating these strange UAPs 70 plus years ago, which we don't need to imagine because the Arrow report confirms this. What part of the government was best equipped to do this type of work? The Department of Defense. The same Department of Defense that refused to admit that Area 51 even existed until 2013, even though we all knew about it no later than the 1980s after the Bob Lazar interviews. So let's say when the DOD investigated UFOs, they actually managed to recover some of these craft and reverse engineer parts of them, leading to massive breakthroughs in technology. And let's imagine that the DOD, which is known for its black programs and massive budget disparities, managed to bury this program for decades. And during that time, the people involved, which by 2011 includes both government and private corporations, get lots of power, money, and virtually no oversight. I think this is what people are really talking about when they talk about a deep state in our government. Unelected, institutional government actors with lots of power and no oversight. It's basically what President Eisenhower warned about in his farewell address. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. Then you get a few senators, a Nevada businessman, and some scientists who put together a proposal that would require these actors to turn over all this hidden material and technology. Seems like a pretty good motive to say no to powerful senators. It would also explain the program's sudden encrypted cancellation in December of 2011 and the government's subsequent attempt to disprove what Grush said in 2023. Also consistent with trying to control the narrative is releasing classified documents 12 years early about a proposed reverse engineering program that was ultimately rejected. That's the government saying, see, we thought about reverse engineering UAPs, but we didn't actually do it. And while this theory has been confirmed by multiple people in a position to know, some of the less nefarious explanations we discussed earlier seem completely plausible for Kona Blue's cancellation. 
I'm sure everything is fine. But based on the information we have from the government, it feels like we're missing part of the all sap Kona Blue story. Was it canceled for legitimate reasons? Or were Grush, Coltert, and Colonel Nell telling the truth and trying to expose the deep state? Let me know what you think in the comments. Thank you for joining me on this project, and we'll see you on the next one. Until then, watch out for the lizard people.